Welcome to our Lung Health Webinar Wednesday series. Happy to have you here with us this evening. And we have a special event this evening as we have partnered with the American Lung Association due to Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And together, we are working as a team here to put on tonight's event. Um, as we have the opportunity to get you all together tonight, we are really ensuring that patients are getting the right care they need in the era of COVID and want to ensure that those discussions happen amongst an audience this evening. And um, we have an opportunity to ask questions as well as to, um, to hear from a group of panelists. And I'll just advance my slide here. Richard, can I? Oh, there we go. Um, perfect. So the program objectives tonight are really to gain insights on the value of engaging your institutions in Lung Health Cancer Awareness Month, gather strategies to address the entire care continuum for lung cancer patients during the era of COVID, as well as to learn how to engage your patients to ensure they are getting the right care they need during these unpredictable times. Next slide. So tonight we are joined by uh, a patient, uh, a stage three lung cancer survivor who has a very impactful story to share with you all. Um, I'd like to welcome Joan Wolfenden to our event this evening and the American Lung Association was able to connect with Joan. And so we're really thankful that she is here with us this evening. On the next slide, I'd like to introduce the panelists that will be presenting um, to us tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Albert Rizzo. He is the Chief Medical Officer for the American Lung Association, as well as a practicing physician and a professor of medicine at Thomas Jefferson University. We have also with us Dr. Ravi Bashara, who is the Professor of Medicine, uh, Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, and the Co-Director for Interventional Pulmonology uh, at the Medical College of Georgia School of Medicine in Augusta. And we also have with us this evening, Shonda Blackman. Dr. Blackman is a thoracic surgeon and the professor of surgery and a part of the Mayo Clinic facility out of Rochester, Minnesota. And the next slide, I'm just gonna talk through a couple of things here and you can click through a couple of slides here, um, Richard, or a couple of bullet points here, but I wanted to just touch base on something here as we get started. Uh, with Medtronic sponsoring this event this evening, I wanted to make sure that folks really understood that the uh, mission of Medtronic um, is something that we live by as an organization. It was started by our founder, uh, Earl Bakken, back in 1960 and remains the same today. And if you talk to any Medtronic employee, I think one thing they will tell you is that the mission is something that we live by daily. Uh, with regards to how we uh, practice uh, the work that we do and knowing that uh, all of our efforts um, to, to do the work that we do focus on alleviating pain, restoring health, and extending life for our patients uh, and something uh, that I uh, wanted to make sure that folks understood and, and, uh, and knew and is something that we're really proud of as an organization. On the next slide, if you'll go to, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the stage of lung cancer and some of the things we as a, a company are looking out for. And Richard, click one more time here and the next um, portion of the slide will show. Um, our aspiration is to find lung cancer early and to treat with a curative intent. Uh, and I know that we all know, all of us on the phone here this evening, there's definite opportunity in this space to do more. Um, we really would like to flip the equations of what you see in front of you here on a variety of uh, areas around lung cancer care. Um, I'll highlight just a couple of these. The first really being uh, the number of patients that are diagnosed uh, at later stage. We're obviously wanting to ensure that we get these patients at stage one or stage two where the opportunity to treat is certainly much greater. Uh, wanting to ensure that the right number of patients are really receiving the right surgical intervention or treatment. Right now, we know that that's not occurring at the level we need it to. Uh, ensuring that patients have the ability for minimally invasive surgery uh, instead of such invasive surgeries that are often taking place now. 
And then really also, I think a big one is just looking at the average days from when patients present with a lung nodule to when they get treated, uh, you know, 150 to 180 days is certainly not acceptable to anybody here. And um, knowing that we're in the efforts to, to move that to less than 30 days will truly help advance uh, lung cancer care. Next slide, Richard. You can keep going. And then the other thing I wanted to chat with you about here, I'm sorry, these are all building sides, Richard, so you got to push one more time. Um, really wanted to look at um, a couple of areas of opportunity. We know that we want to identify patients earlier in the process, as I mentioned, um, lots of opportunity to, to do that. Um, improving diagnostics, we have the opportunity with um, the appropriate equipment to biopsy, diagnose, and stage from a single event and ensure that we're attacking these nodules to find disease early. Uh, we also know that there's opportunity to improve diagnostics um, by really investing in the next generation platforms to ensure that we have adequate biopsying and the ability to determine staging and treatment. And then lastly, really accelerating patient recovery, um, really aiming to shorten the inpatient stay, minimize complications, and reduce readmissions. And my last slide here, one more click, is really just showcasing that Medtronic is in this for the long haul. Um, we have a variety of things that we are using with our customers here to look at uh, ways to screen patients through our lung GPS programs, as well as, as I mentioned, ways to diagnose with our uh, ENB platform. Uh, as well as the ability to treat, as I mentioned earlier, with curative intent. And we are moving into the ablation uh, space here coming up this, this winter. So really looking forward to, to what we can do. And I know it takes all of us together to ensure that we uh, create a future here for our uh, lung cancer patients that's better than where it stands today. So with that, I will, um, you can advance to the next slide, Richard, and we're gonna move into the panelist discussion here. And so I guess my first question will be for you, Dr. Rizzo. I wanted to have you spend some time talking about what the American Lung Association is doing for patient advocacy during the Lung Cancer Awareness Month here in November this year. Well, thank you, Jody, and thank you for asking me and the American Lung Association to participate in the panel. I'd like to take the next few minutes to summarize the busy month of activities that the ALA is promoting for lung cancer awareness. It's been a particularly challenging year, but as an organization, it's also been very important for us to ensure that we're taking the action to support lung cancer patients and caregivers through this pandemic with our ongoing resources like our Lung Helpline, our online Inspire support communities, and our collaboration with Immerman Angels, which is a lung cancer patient mentoring partnership. To these ongoing efforts, we will add additional initiatives, raising awareness of lung cancer as the number one cancer killer of both men and women. On our website and social media throughout the month, we'll be sharing inspiring lung force hero stories through our 30 Days, 30 Heroes Challenge and helping Americans learn that anyone can get lung cancer and no one deserves it. Earlier this summer, we launched a new podcast series called LungCast. The first three episodes, as you might suspect, were COVID related, including an interview with Dr. Fauci that I was able to do. But for Lung Cancer Awareness this Month, our podcast, which went live yesterday, featured our co-investigators of the Lung Cancer Interception Dream Team, Dr. Ivy Spira and Dr. Stephen Dubinette. The study is a collaborative research effort supported by the American Lung Association, Stand Up to Cancer and Longevity. Listeners will learn how progress is being made in intercepting lung cancer at its very earliest stages, which will also translate into more lives saved. Yesterday, we also had our first ever virtual lung cancer patient meetup, which featured sessions on living with lung cancer in the time of COVID-19, navigating lung cancer clinical trials during COVID-19, and breakout sessions that focused on seven individual tumor mutations for the support of patients and their caregivers. During the month, we're also gonna redouble our efforts related to our awareness campaign, Saved by the Scan, which is now in its third year with updated media assets in conjunction with the Ad Council. 
The Save by the Scan campaign has reached over 500,000 Americans who have now taken our Save by the Scan eligibility quiz. Through this, we've seen tremendous increases in key awareness and attitudinal metrics since our launch in 2017. These include a 40% increase in awareness of low dose CT scanning and a 22% increase in survey respondents who reported actually being screened annually. Also this month, we launched our Lung Cancer Courage Kits, which is an educational engagement tool for newly diagnosed lung cancer patients. This came out of our uh, Lung Cancer Patient Advisory Group and is being piloted in the state of Arkansas, where after discussing things with nurse navigators and oncologists, we were able to ship out uh, gift cards and photos of the kit to be distributed to 14 facilities in the healthcare system throughout that state. Another initiative will take place on November 19th. In conjunction with the American Hospital Association, we are giving an online presentation on driving up utilization of lung cancer screening to drive down lung cancer mortality. We're gonna focus on the American Thoracic Society and the American Lung Association's Lung Cancer Screening Implementation Guide, which outlines how to design, implement, and conduct a lung cancer screening program. With the current eligibility criteria, we know there are about eight to nine million candidates but the uptake in this screening has been woefully slower than we would like. If the new recommendations by the United States Preventive Services Task Force go into effect with a lower pack year need of only 20 and a younger age of 50, the eligible population will increase significantly and many more lives could be saved by the early diagnosis of lung cancer with screening. And lastly, I would like to highlight and address our third annual State of Lung Cancer Report, which will launch on November 17th. This report provides state data not previously available in other reports with important new results on lung cancer disparities among racial and ethnic groups. We believe this report will provide policymakers, researchers, and healthcare practitioners, really anyone committed to ending lung cancer, a good foundation for identifying where their state can best focus its resources to decrease the burden of lung cancer. The nationwide burden of lung cancer is large, but is not the same everywhere. This report finds that there is more each state can do to turn the tide against this terrible disease and save more lives. The measures we have compiled and ranked where possible include new cases, survival, early diagnosis, surgical treatment, lack of treatment, screening rate, and data on the coverage by Medicaid fee-for-service programs in each state. Through this report, we believe we can empower the public with information they can leverage to start the local change we need to see. And since knowledge is power, these data can be used to galvanize policy change. So thank you for letting me share our initiatives and I'll be glad to answer questions during the Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Rizzo. And gosh, a lot to share with everybody. And we appreciate all that the American Lung Association is doing for our patients. Dr. Bashara, you are next. Uh, I know you are a spokesperson for the American Lung Association and wanted to talk about the role you play in patient advocacy. So again, it's a pleasure to uh, be here today and to all our patients and especially our patients with lung cancer. I wanna tell them that they humble us and they remind us why we are here, where we come to work every single day. Um, as you have heard from Dr. Rizzo before me about all the activities that the American Lung Association has been involved directly or indirectly or in collaboration with other major corporations and institutions to bring not only the awareness, but also to uh, push further on the treatment and the other options for our patients. Our uh, Part of our job uh, as being a spokespeople for the American Lung Association is to take that news and basically increase the awareness uh, of the people about it and answer questions from the media as well as other institutions about what can we do and what the Lung Association is trying to do and is doing to promote recognition of abnormalities and early detection of lung cancer as well as therapeutics and research potentials. Uh, it's a very significant role that translates along different scales. So in addition to just the awareness to bring it up to the individuals and to the people, it also brings support from other medical and non-medical institutions. So also support the American Lung Association and the Lung Force with all its different branches to uh, bring that awareness more and more and distribute it to the public. Um, 
Many important things I can uh, talk about here. Number one, as Dr. Rizzo has said, the fact that the age uh, for testing is coming down to 50 and the amount of smoking is also considered to be less so people can be eligible for lung screening is a major thing, which definitely increases the number of people eligible to do that. And this is a very important message that we as spokespeople have to bring to the individuals as well as to uh, other institutions. The other thing is also the uh, availability of multiple clinical trials and research trials. Some are funded by the American Lung Association individually or by conjunction of other institutions is another uh, uh, object for us to bring to the different individuals as well as different societies uh, that are interested in that field. Uh, but also as the most important thing to bring is actually a message of hope. And the reason why is because as you can see from the emerging data, um, the longevity and the life expectancy of people with even advanced lung cancer is much better as compared to before. And this is because of all the efforts that actually uh, the American Lung Association as well as other major institutions have been doing and all the endeavors that they have already been accomplished. Wonderful, thank you very much for that. And now we're gonna to move to our patient, Joan. And um, Joan, I wanted to ask you, I, I really appreciate you being here first off and foremost, and I know um, this is not something you typically do, so we appreciate you being here with us this evening. Uh, I know you were diagnosed in 2012 with stage three cancer and wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about your journey with lung cancer thus far from diagnostic to treatment, to survivorship. Thank you for having me. Um, I just, I had my lung cancer journey started in 2012 when I had an episode of hemoptysis and that led to the diagnosis of non-small cell. Uh, that was in the summer and treatment included simultaneous radiation and chemo and then entire right lung resection because it didn't work out when they just tried to take the one lobe out. Um, and then I had two heavy chemo hits after that, and that's finally, I lost all my hair. I returned to work as a medical transcriptionist for a national company in about March of 2013. That job required eight to 10 hours a day sitting at a computer. And the intense pain in my back brought my production almost to a halt uh, to require me to apply for disability. It was determined that I suffer from intercostal syndrome, which is something a lot of us suffer. Um, it's a nerve damage thing and it's chronic and it's forever. I, I control it with Tylenol and exercise, walking. Um, and uh, something, you know, life went on and my husband retired. We were able to, to go up and down the coast and visit relatives. I walked walk, weather permitting, to increase my lung capacity and maintain my stamina. And fast forward to May of 2018, we lost our brother to lung and colon cancer. As one of his caretakers, I ran myself right down to the ground. I contracted pneumonia, which gradually evolved into an empyema in my right lung space. I was hospitalized four times between July and December and the final regime of antibiotics and a chest tube cleared up my respiratory issues finally, but then I developed C. diff. It recurred three times each one week after I finished up the antibiotics. My GI doctor graciously surrendered me over to a clinical trial that I discovered. I may have been cured finally by oral FMT. Poop pills. I was sick for a year altogether. I've been working hard to build myself back up. I live in fear of getting sick again, of ever having to take antibiotics. I did get very sick in January of this year. My GP ordered a chest X-ray, which showed no pneumonia. So we skipped the antibiotics and wrote it out. And that brings us to now. Thank you. Appreciate your story and certainly one of um of perseverance and, um, and dealing with a, a lot of things here. And I know we have more of your story yet to come, but um, thank you for, for sharing that with us. Um, Dr. Blackman, I'm gonna ask you next, can you talk a little bit about what Lung Cancer Awareness Month means to you and the efforts that you are taking this month with the Mayo 
uh, clinic to drive greater awareness of lung cancer. Um, thank you, Jody. I would just like to say that at Mayo, since we take care of patients almost 5,000 a year with lung cancer, we really try to make every month Lung Cancer Awareness Month, not just this month. So our outreach efforts include uh, lung cancer screening, uh, actively still operating on patients with lung cancer in spite of the COVID pandemic, and reaching out to allow more patients to have active access to lung cancer care through being active on social media, advocating with uh, the government to try to help expand the indications for lung cancer screening and uh, get more people options for uh, insurance to get more care. Um, we're also working actively on our website to enhance education and working on ways to help with a lung cancer blog to reach out to people. I've also spent some time with the um, Breath of Hope, which is an organization locally that is a lung cancer support group that created an animated patient series that educates patients about lung cancer. And um, really everything we can, every time somebody reaches out, um, no matter how busy I am, I try to be available during Lung Cancer Awareness Month and anytime because I think, you know, my grandfather died from lung cancer and I'm a lung cancer surgeon. So I'm, I'm passionate about it and I do whatever I can to raise awareness all the time, but especially this month. Um, at Mayo, we used to have a big event with an inflatable lung and smoking cessation and patient education, but because of COVID, COVID some of those uh, active social community events have been canceled. So now we're restricted to participating in webinars and education series and reaching out to patients. But probably one of the most things that I do during this month is I try to remember all of the patients that I've cared for that unfortunately have died from lung cancer. And I try to respect their memory and spend time thinking about them and especially people who made a huge influence on my life. Uh, even though I might not have been their doctor or cared for them, I remember the survivors and how they really reached out to people over the years. A good example is Catherine Benson recently died from lung cancer, and she was a leader in our local community in Minnesota, um, raising awareness of lung cancer and really making it possible for people to realize that she never smoked. She was incredibly healthy. She was a mother of four. She didn't do anything to deserve lung cancer. No one did anything to deserve lung cancer. And she um, finally succumbed to that disease. And I think I spend a lot of time really thinking about that and how unfair it is and how we have to raise awareness. And if we could just diagnose everyone early uh, when it's resectable or treatable, I think um, trying to get more research funding allocated towards lung cancer research, maybe making it equitable to breast cancer research funding, um, and really just letting people know what our needs are. I think that's mostly what we're doing. It's, it's all over the board, but I think the main message is paying respect to those people who are suffering from lung cancer and paying special attention to them during this month. Yeah, appreciate that and appreciate the awareness and the, the call to action for everybody here. Um, Dr. Rizzo, I'm going to ask you, so since we've, we've brought up now that, you know, and are in the era of COVID-19, um, and certainly we know that the numbers are going to start to increase. We're seeing that in certain states around the country and, um, you know, the season um, of of uh, sickness seems to, to occur more in the fall and winter months. What is, what is the American Lung Association doing right now to help patients who might be vulnerable with the, to the virus, but still in need of lung care? Well, really back in April, our uh, CEO said, we need to be stepping up about COVID. And we developed the COVID-19 Action Initiative, uh, which really is a $25 million program over three years that we kind of put into the three arms of our mission, which include education, advocacy, and research. 
from an education standpoint, we started to have weekly webinars for patients uh, back in May, I believe we started. Uh, we've also instituted a series of town halls once a month for patients and caregivers, uh, looking at different topics that included disparities among COVID-19, vaccine development. Uh, we also looked at testing. So a lot of ways for patients to learn in addition to our ongoing website and blogs. Uh, the other thing that uh, has already been mentioned, we are very strongly advocating to help improve the social determinants of health that make a difference with regard to who succumbs to COVID-19. We know that the black and the, the communities of color and those socially economically deprived are suffering much more from COVID-19 and its complications. And we know that that can only be corrected with both state and federal legislation to help make sure access to care is equal across the board. We've also tried to raise awareness about the importance of ongoing cancer screening. I think there's been a number of issues over the last several months where there's been a concern that not just lung cancer screening, but screening of any cancers have been delayed because facilities have slowed down, manpower needs directed them to other places, and patients were afraid to come out to centers to get their mammogram or their CT scan. So we need to kind of redouble those efforts to make sure people get back on track. And then from a research standpoint, we initiated a new pool of money and have put $3 million into COVID research, specifically around things like therapeutics, uh, understanding the immune system, and also developing ways for communities to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. So we're trying to address it uh, multiple ways. And certainly the patients are always at the center of this, whether it's education, advocating, or research to find new therapies and cures. Yeah, thank you. Great to see all the activities that are that are happening there for our patients, and um, and hopefully people are taking good uh, good good notes and, and taking advantage of that opportunity. Um, Joan, um, speaking of patients, um, wanted you to talk a little bit about your experience of living with the risk of garnering COVID nineteen, as you are a lung cancer patient and um, somebody that I am sure has dealt with the fear of this disease. I'm still living with it. Um, it, it. Some of my sisters planned a trip. We all met in Florida in March of 2020. I got there on the 1st and stayed through the 10th. And during that time, my sister who am I staying with and I watched the news with growing concern every day. Another sister and her husband flew in from the heart of Seattle and we all teased them and saying, don't touch Teresa Marty, whatever you do. I flew home on a Tuesday. I got in a game of pickleball at our local indoor rec center on Thursday and the world stopped on Friday. Howard and I quickly developed a plan that would protect us both, but especially me. With one lung, I was most at risk. Just like everyone else, we ordered online, waited in line for available delivery and pickup dates, ate all our meals at home, just basically stayed at home. We did get a trip to the Chesapeake in June when Maryland determined it was safe enough to partially open. Where we go is a small, sparsely populated island below St. Michael's. They had no COVID cases yet to that date, so we were comfortable just hanging out on the water, fishing, raiding, relaxing, and getting away. Around the time we came back home, uh, the kids brought the grandbabies up and we swam and had to stay outside. We could not touch our grandchildren. It was surreal, but it was necessary as my daughter-in-law's father was home sick with cancer. Um, we stayed outdoors the whole time it was necessary. And a few weeks later on July 8th, one of Howard's sisters suffered a fatal heart attack. His grief stricken family went ahead with a funeral, all the bells and whistles. It was two days with the viewing, the luncheon, everything. Her funeral was on the 14th and 15th. I tried my best to stay safe, just going to the viewing for a few minutes before the doors were open to the public mourners. Did social distancing, and a few days after that, Howard and I talked about how distressed I was about the whole arrangement, and he agreed that it was a very bad decision and admitted he wasn't feeling well. He tested positive on the 23rd. I tested positive on the 25th, excuse me. He continued to worsen and I sent him off to the hospital by ambulance with a pulse ox of 49 on the 28th. That was the last time he walked away from his home. I remained asymptomatic. It turns out other members of the family also tested positive after the funeral. I also later found out that one of the people was actually running a fever and not feeling well 
at the funeral. Having to quarantine by myself for 14 days, I was restricted from going to see Howard. Five days into his hospital stay, while still mobile and able to maneuver, he sat up in a chair and had a stroke. It's ironic how he knew to move around to keep from getting clots and he gets one. He was evaluated and the medical team attempted a thrombectomy, which was unsuccessful and resulted in the inability to remove him from the vent, which was required for anesthesia. A heart attack resulted in a request for last rites, which I participated in over speakerphone as I was still grounded. Howard rallied for another two weeks about after that, but had worsened again until we said goodbye to him on September 2nd. His treatments initially were remdesivir for 10 days and dexamethasone. He then got convalescent plasma through a John Hopkins clinical trial. Antibiotics were administered as signs of infection appeared out of nowhere. And his daughter and I watched through the window as the nurses stayed with him, soothing him and talking to him as they shoved the bin off and he slipped away. My husband's death was needless and, un and so avoidable. Dwelling on the fact that he likely contracted the virus from another family member does me absolutely no good. The fallout from his death is incredible. My role in advocacy is to share my story and to warn others that this virus is very real and so, so dangerous. Thank you, Joan, so much for sharing that story of courage and strength and really, truly what COVID can do to, to people. So thank you for, for sharing that. I know we're going to hear from you one more time and maybe more even this evening, but really want to say thank you for that heartfelt, impactful story and a shame that something like that had to happen. So Dr. Bashara, can you talk a little bit about how you are weighing the risks for patients getting screened or undergoing diagnostic procedures for lung cancer versus the risk of COVID-19? Ms. Wolfenden, um, our hearts and minds go to you and your family. You are an amazing person and a very strong woman. Uh, I just want to tell you that. Um, Thank you. You really inspire um, many of us, at least, at least you have inspired me. I can say that, um, mm -hmm. you know, during this COVID era, which, uh, sadly to say, maybe it's a new normal and hopefully that will be the new abnormal that one day we'll, we'll get out of it. It's important to do two things for, uh, uh, our patients with potential lung cancer or lung cancer to move on with their journey is number one, to, uh, keep on working with them. And number two is actually to do that safely which brings us to your question. What do we do in the COVID era and how did we adapt? Uh, the medical institutions, all the medical institutions had to adapt to make sure that the patients are still getting what they need. Because again, uh, if they don't, then this is basically a sample of death. You have to move on with this, it's deadly disease. But at the same time, it's not only about protection of the patient, it's the patient as well as the physicians and the healthcare professionals and everybody else in the hospital. So the uh, early maneuvers were to make sure that everybody is tested uh, before um, you know, any procedures is performed in the institution. And that is done within 72 hours. So we only accept tests which are maximum within 72 hours. And this is based on the symptoms and when the patient becomes symptomatic in case they, they have acquired disease. Uh, at the same time is to assure the patient that the procedures that they may get or the workup that they may get does not increase their risk of acquiring the, the virus. Uh, and hence, we had to make sure that all the precautions that uh, have been advocated by the uh, American Lung Association and about the CDC and about the NIH are definitely followed uh, to every and in each detail. Um, and number three is, uh, we also worked with the American Association of Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology to also uh, spread to patients that whenever they get their workup, and especially with the non-invasive procedures, such as endoscopic procedures, they will not be at increased risk of acquiring the disease by getting this procedure. And that was very important because patients were very hesitant uh, in getting a diagnosis and or even staging, which is a main part of the beginning of their journey through 
that cancer therapy. So we had to make sure that uh, we give them the important information that we decrease the anxiety and we tell them the truth that yes, if they need these procedures based on everything that the institution is doing, their risk of acquiring or potentially acquiring the virus actually is not increased. And therefore they should keep on going down that journey because time is life as far as they're concerned. And the fourth thing that was also very important is like you said, it's a multidisciplinary approach to make sure that these standardizations and these criteria are applied to every single member and every single department within that same institution that cares for these patients. And lastly, um, but not the least important is the fact that despite we had the COVID era and despite cancellation of many procedures and many therapeutics in medicine, the care for cancer patients, not only lung cancer patients, but this is, this is lung cancer awareness month, so definitely for the lung cancer patients, was not stopped and was not placed on hold. And that was very important dedication from the uh, administrative uh, teams that occurred in all the institutions to make sure that these cancer patients still get what they need and still move along in their journey through their multidisciplinary team. And definitely doing that safely. Yeah, thank you. So important. And timing in this disease state is such a critical thing. So I appreciate um, some of the things that you're doing. Dr. Blackman was going to ask you, can you talk a little bit about what you're telling your patients right now that are presenting with lung cancer regarding treatment and maybe what Mayo is doing that other programs could consider supporting patients during this time? Yes, I'd just like to start again by recognizing Joan and her brave statement. I can't emphasize how important her story is for other lung cancer survivors, because I do think her story should resonate with anyone who has lung cancer. Um, the decisions that patients make are so important, not just for the lives of themselves, but those that they love and the people around them. Um, and thank you, Joan, for sharing your story. At Mayo Clinic, the, I would give you three, I give most of my lung cancer patients three main messages. The first one is don't delay. So if you have a suspicious lung nodule, don't put it off until COVID vaccine is out. I think most people who have a lung cancer diagnosis need to get to treatment within a month. And those people that put it off, we don't know when the time will be perfect for them to come into the hospital. But what I can say is although it's not perfect, it is good. And at Mayo Clinic, we are screening every patient before they come in. Every single patient is evaluated with a COVID test before they're allowed to receive any interventional treatment and they're carefully protected from getting infected by everyone. And every care provider wears an N95 mask and protective eyewear for invasive procedures. So I, I think right now the number one message is don't delay care. The number two message is to protect yourself. And the story of Joan should remind you how important that is. For patients who might have a lung nodule that's suspicious, delaying can mean that the cancer is advanced and not protecting yourself can mean that you might end up getting delayed because if you get COVID, you will not be able to get treatment for your lung cancer. And then the third thing is to get the treatment. So patients coming in with a suspicious lung nodule for lung cancer screening, for evaluation or testing, they need to be able to get through that treatment to be able to survive. And so patients really need to be brave enough to go to institutions that are able to protect them and protect the healthcare providers and create a, a scene where the patients can feel confident that their treatment is being delivered to them in the safest way possible. The other things that I think we're doing that are a little bit novel and maybe different from other places is we're doing video visits. And the video visits are very exact, they're through Zoom. So it's just like this, only it's between the provider and the patient. And patients have given us tremendous positive feedback on this. 
Instead of making a patient travel and get exposed and come in, we can share our screen and show them their medical record. We can show them their CAT scan, their PET scan, their bronchoscopy. We can show them all of their information and they don't even have to come into the clinic to get all of that. And they can record the session so that if their kids want to find out how the visit went, it's quite easy to do. So the video visits have really, you know, we were doing them before COVID, but now that COVID's happened, that is one of the things that I would say are the good things that's coming out of COVID. It's made that accelerate and it's really made it easier for us to reach out to patients, especially in other states where we were real, a little bit reluctant to offer the video visit. Now any patient can get a video visit. The other thing that's really changed is we're doing a virtual tumor board. So much like this group, we have experts in lung cancer care at Mayo who meet daily to discuss the complex patients and review everything. So we have radiation oncology, medical oncology, surgeons, radiologists, pathologists, and we just go through the list and make sure everyone gets discussed and we make sure we make good decisions on how we care for patients. So everyone that needs a review through the complex tumor board can get it. And then at Mayo Rochester, our tumor board is now worldwide and we'll have people dialing in from the Middle East who are Mayo affiliates or Europe or uh, other countries where they might not have access to the same resources that we do. We're now offering this tumor board access to many other hospitals so that they can get expert level evaluation for their patients. Um, those are the main things that we're doing. I think our regular things that we do and have always done well, like patient education and mayoclinic.org and helping with smoking cessation and coaching and counseling and screening and COVID testing, all those things are still happening. But I think the video interactions have really changed the way we practice. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love the creativity that we have all been forced to have to think outside of the box to do things different. Uh, and knowing that some of these things will be a way of life now moving forward because they truly are working and um, allowing more, more access to more people to be involved and educated and trained. So thank you. Joan, as a, as a patient advocate, Wondering what your advice is to physicians that are caring for lung cancer patients right now during this COVID time. Um, well, that's a tough one for me to answer as I'm currently not going under any kind of treatment for cancer. Um, during this, I did reach out to my pulmonologist who I've got to share with you. He did save my life twice. So let's go for three. Um, when Howard was in the hospital and I was home under quarantine and I tested positive, I called him and he offered me very sage sound advice, which I heeded, what vitamins to take, what to do, what not to do. And to you guys, to physicians, please be patient and place yourselves in your patient situations. Your job now not only involves cancer cure, care and treatment, which is more known than the unknown monster of the virus. Reach out and seriously check mental status what is really happening in your patients' lives, if you can. And make sure your navigators have every resource. They've been offered the latest updates and resources available to every single cancer patient that you have. That's it. Yeah, really important words to share. We appreciate that, um, that feedback coming from you and all that you have been through. So hopefully everybody is, uh, is taking heed and listening to, to what you as the patients are really truly needing. And, and Dr. Bashar, I guess I'd ask you, you know, what, experience, what are your experiences right now in treating lung cancer patients? Uh, what are some of the things that you're experiencing and what have you had to do to adjust your clinical practice? Well, like Dr. Blackman had mentioned, uh, one of the main things that emerged, uh, like, like she said, the bust of things that have emerged through that is, uh, especially for us, you know, procedural proceduralists, if you want to call us, you know, we don't have to bring the patients back after the procedure to, uh, you know, go over the results uh, and to expose them to, you know, potentially, you know, getting, getting infected with something. So we 
definitely did a lot of uh, um, video uh, clinic visits. And again, whether it's within the state or across you know, other states, wherever the patient is. The key is, you know, uh, we did that in a very short period of time as soon as the uh, results come up. But at the same time, we have to make sure that, you know, the other individuals uh, within the thoracic uh, oncology group are also aware of that uh, in very prompt fashion. So actually that journey continues. And like you, you mentioned in the beginning of the slides, you know, to bring the time from diagnosis to treatment, you know, to within, you know, maximum of two weeks. Otherwise, you know, we have lost time, which eventually transferred to life. And I believe this is very, very important. Um, other important things is definitely, you know, uh, educating the patients that they have to get their care because if they don't get their care, then they are losing time and they are wasting time. And three, make sure to protect yourselves, whether you're at home or whether you're not at home, make sure to, you know, follow all the precautions that you need, because if you don't and you get sick, then definitely you are going to be delayed and that will be a negative aspect you know, related to you. Uh, I believe education you know, became more important. It always, always has been important, but I think it has kind of risen up in you know, the one, two, three, four, which one is important, you know, as far as uh, the interactions with patients to make sure that you know, they are aware of the uh, uh, things that are going around to make sure that they are taking the right precautions to protect themselves as well as others, and to make sure that uh, they do what they need to do to keep on self-protected, but importantly, to continue communicating with their physician whenever they need to, and at the same time, to get the prompt response to move on forward. I think a major part of it is also, especially if you are an academic institution, which all of us are, is also to bring that to our trainees because they're also at the forefront of all that, you know, with the patients and with the procedures and with the COVID and all this stuff. So also to make sure that, you know, these wonderful people who have dedicated their time to study and to get to where they need to get also play a very important role in managing their patients who are eventually our patients and to make sure that uh, these lessons are learned and the message is definitely translated down to make sure that uh, it definitely takes place. I appreciate those words, Dr. Bashara, and um, great, great advice for people to consider in their practice. Dr. Blackman, one last question, and then we're going to open it up for some questions, and I know there already are some sitting here, so we'll get to that in just a moment, but wanted to just see if there's any advice related to um, how medical device and or industry should and could be supporting you physicians more right now in, during these unprecedented times. Thank you for asking. Um, I think one of the best ways that we can get support from industry is, again, to fund research. I think lung cancer research is underfunded in general. Um, helping us to answer those burning questions to find the right treatment and the best treatment for our patients. Helping us to build better tools. Um, good examples of that, since I'm a thoracic surgeon, um, you guys have built a curved tip stapler that helps me get safer around blood vessels. You've built a smaller stapler that helps me do more careful, meticulous dissections. You've helped develop an energy device that doesn't put holes in vessels, but seals them effectively. Continuing to create these amazing tools that help us give amazing surgery to patients is really the key. But one of the things that I think Medtronic has done particularly well is raise awareness about the benefit of minimally invasive surgery. And Joan was sharing a story about how she has post-thoracotomy pain syndrome. I can't help but wonder if she had an open thoracotomy because so many of our patients who have minimally invasive surgery really don't suffer from that chronic post-thoracotomy pain syndrome from having the rib cut and the rib spread and the muscle of the chest wall cut. I, I think a lot of patients go to people who do lung surgery and they aren't aware that there are other options out there and that minimally invasive surgery might give them less pain, quicker recovery, less blood loss, and a quicker return to chemotherapy if they need it. So I think Medtronic has done a great job on raising awareness about the benefits of minimally invasive surgery, 
providing minimally invasive surgeons like myself with better tools. And I think more sessions like this, this is a great way to raise awareness. So you guys are already engaging in some of the things that I think you need to be. Perhaps if you want advice, just keep doing what you're doing and you do it well. So thank you for doing that. Um, I really, I, I appreciate it. I've been using your uh, tools and devices now for my entire career, I think uh, since 2003. And um, I, I appreciate all of the technology. I, I feel like you listen to me when I ask for development in one area or another. And I feel like the tools that you build help me to do surgery that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you for your feedback. Appreciate that. And um, I think collaboration is the name of the game, whether you're industry and, and, uh, and customers or even within your own institutions working uh, across the lines with one another is how we will move this disease state forward. So I've got some questions here and I'm just gonna throw this out to the group. Um, so the first one I'm seeing here on my screen is a question from Dean Mosen. Is there any study regarding long-term impact of SARS on the lung? Well, all right, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think like a lot of things with COVID-19, we're still early on learning about what the disease does, especially if we're looking at chronic things. One of the recent town halls we had was about what's called the long haulers or the chronic COVID. Now, many of them have non-pulmonary symptoms of fatigue, easy fatigability, brain fog, uh, good days, bad days. Then there's also this population who've gone on to have persistent findings on CAT scans of their chest, some of which are going on to fibrosis, we don't know how long that may persist, whether it will progress, whether there is any specific treatment. There are clinical trials starting to enroll patients with those findings to see if some of the therapeutics we have, such as the antifibrotics, may be helpful. But I'm not aware of anything that's shown any benefit as yet because it's just too early to see those results. I'll chime in for a couple of minutes. As we are still early in disease, um, well, and then looking at the potential complications, uh, fortunately, people who survive. I think the major issue is until we get some adequate data, because we know that there's some postmortem data that has shown that there's some damage and it can be subclinical damage, not only to the lung, but also to other organs uh, in the body. And that has been proven uh, on postmortem studies. The key is to tell the patients that if they had any habits that may injure their lungs, I'm gonna talk about you know, smoking or vaping. Vaping is very important. To make sure that not to come back to it. They've been in the hospital, they haven't done it for a while and luckily they survived and left the hospital. So guess what? Don't do it again because we don't know what will happen to your lung and respiratory status. But if anything, you can do something good to yourself and of course to others. Is not going back to these bad habits that may predispose you to further complications if you end up having some related to your COVID and recovery from it. Or developing lung cancer on top of already having compromised lungs if you've had COVID. All right, the other question that's out here is, is SARS a predisposing factor of lung cancer? Not that we know. <laughs> I don't think we know. Although I would say I see a lot of patients who have trauma or a cough like Joan or symptoms and it brings them in, I, I do think we'll be diagnosing more lung cancer because of COVID, we're now doing a lot more imaging of the lung. And as you know, we will likely be detecting a lot more lung nodules. The big question at hand is as we identify more lung nodules, Will we be also performing more procedures to investigate those lung nodules? And will we be safely evaluating them and not over intervening on these lung nodules and only taking out nodules that have cancer in them? Those are really the important questions. And the same questions that we ask when we evaluate the effectiveness of lung cancer screening. 
Okay, great. Here's another question from the audience. Um, surgery is the number one way for possible cure for early stage lung cancer. How does it work with surgeons wanting to do surgery and pulmonologists wanting to do EBIS and ENB in early stage? NCCN guidelines say if there is a high suspicion that a nodule is cancer, do surgery. Pulmonologists seem to want to do EBIS and navigation first. What are your thoughts? Well, so I'm an interventional pulmonologist, and uh, that is not scientifically true. Uh, I think, like uh, Dr. Blackman has said, you know, what is the adequate approach and the correct approach to patients with abnormalities? And that's the major thing. Uh, do we have to operate on everybody or we do not? So EBIS and navigation are a little bit different, right? So endoscopic ultrasonography, the main role for it is actually to diagnose and stage. And usually it's done prior to surgery uh, because you know, depending on the stage, a patient could be surgical or non-surgical. Data has shown that uh, EBIS, instead of, we're not gonna go into uh, too much scientific details, but EBIS is the standard of care as far as staging prior to surgery. So yes, it's done. As far as navigation and boxing a single nodule, if somebody has higher risk and the nodule has characteristics, which definitely pushes that person to a higher risk of having it cancerous. And of course, there are also other studies such as genomic modifiers that also can push that further up, then there's no reason for that nodule to be biopsied. Then actually surgery is the way to go. In fact, the NCCI guidelines don't say that should be done, that biopsy should be done. They said if needed and if available, then biopsy could be done. And could does not mean should. Hence, to bring back to what we said before, the multidisciplinary approach for these patients is very important. To have a pulmonologist or advanced endoscopist or interventional pulmonologist, a radiologist, a thoracic surgeon on the table, making sure that that patient gets the adequate care is the key moving on forward. I would just echo what Robbie said. I think uh, as a thoracic surgeon, um, I, not having an interventional pulmonologist on your team would be like trying to build a football team and not having a quarterback or a wide receiver. I think the pulmonologists help us to follow patients in the lung nodule clinic. They help us to stage the mediastinum. They help us to diagnose tumors if we're not sure if it's an invasive lung cancer or not. And they will eventually be helping us to guide out and ablate tumors, much like the interventional radiologists have been doing percutaneously. I also believe that in addition to thoracic surgeons doing that, um, interventional pulmonologists help me in my daily practice by driving out to peripheral lung nodules and injecting a marker and tattooing the tumor so that if I do a segmentectomy, I know exactly where that tumor is and I can spare parts of the lung, especially in people with compromised lung or in people who have multifocal lung cancer. So I think the question seemed like pulmonologists and thoracic surgeons might be in competition, but I would argue to the contrary we are nothing without our interventional pulmonary colleagues. And we work together complementarily uh, to deliver the best, highest level of care. Um, and only offering surgery for patients who clearly have something that we think is highly suspicious of lung cancer and not over intervening in nodules that you know are benign. And again, for us, sure. as a we do not cure lung cancer because we are not surgeons. So uh, we work with them so they can cure the early stage lung cancers and the patients will do much better. So it's really a team as compared to competition. And we wouldn't cure it without you. <laughs> I'm feeling the love. I, it's great. One of the audience members said big shout out for recognizing your peers as, uh, as collaborative partners. So I really want to thank you guys for that. It's, it's refreshing and, and wonderful to see. And as I said earlier, you know, it takes a team to, uh, to make this happen. 
So I know we're uh, a little over the hour here and uh, it's getting into the evening time. And so I wanted to just a couple of things here in front of you. You will actually see a link to a website that Medtronic has that provides lots of information around Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And so if you want to take a look at this website, please feel free to go to MedtronicSolutions.com forward slash LCAM dash 2020. We also would love your feedback uh, on the session this evening. So if you have a camera and want to hold it up to the QR code, it will launch a uh, survey for you. We'll leave it up here for a minute or two, and we would appreciate your feedback as we continue to provide sessions like this. I'd love to know what other things you would like to hear about. Um, we, we hope here that um, it's a successful Lung Cancer Awareness Month as we're headed here into you know, the month of November and truly want to thank the American Lung Association for partnering with us. We want to thank the panelists, Dr. Blackman, Dr. Bashara, and Dr. Rizzo for your time this evening. And most importantly, Joan, we really wanna thank you for your time and your words and your, um, you know, just the ability to inspire the team and carry your husband's legacy forward. I know that was important for you to be able to do, and we really are happy you were able to join us. Thanks for having me. It was my pleasure. You're, you're so welcome. All right, everybody, have a wonderful evening. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Take Thank care. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.